Good morning, good evening, or good afternoon. Um, welcome on behalf of the Learning and Development Working Group of the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action and the Interagency Network for Education and Emergencies to the Integrating Child Protection and Education and Emergencies Programming during COVID-19 webinar. We are looking forward to our time together today. My name is Michelle Van Aken and I work with Plan International. I will be your moderator during this webinar. With funding from USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, PLAN is supporting the LD Working Group in developing capacity building resources for child protection actors to support adapting to COVID-19 realities. While conducting a capacity gaps assessment for this project, we heard about the importance of education as a protective mechanism for children. And we have learned about the many short, medium, and long-term risks to children when schools are closed due to a pandemic like COVID-19. It also became clear that more than ever before, child protection and education actors needed to work together to ensure complementarity in programming and messaging. Child protection and education teams around the world have worked hard to support each other in delivering quality education and PSS programming to children during the COVID-19 pandemic. And this webinar will be an opportunity to hear about some lessons learned as well as successful adaptations. With that, I would like to introduce our three presenters. First, we will be hearing from Mark Chappell, Technical Focal Point Collaboration between Child Protection and Education and Emergencies at the Alliance and INEE. Our second presenter, Beryl, working with World Vision International, will share a case study from Somalia. And our third presenter is Jonas Hamida, who will be sharing a case study from his work with Byford in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Many thanks to our presenters for sharing these experiences. With that, I will pass the mic over to Mark. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Mark Chappell. I'm working across both INEE, the Interagency Network for Education and Emergencies, and the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action on a project set up to bring both sectors more closely together. Um, so it's really good to see uh, this webinar in line with the aims of this project. And I'm here to talk a bit about the project and some of the recent reports that we've done um, supporting and, and providing evidence for the benefits of collaboration. So for those of you who may not be aware, both INE and the Alliance are global networks of actors working on education and child protection in crisis contexts, respectively. Um, so we're really made up of you people, the members of the uh, networks who support and uh, contribute to and benefit from the networks. And they've come together to support and encourage convergence and collaboration between the sectors. And that's primarily my role sitting in both networks and the projects also overseen by multi-agency advisory group, uh, some of whom are on the call today, which is nice to see, um, and uh, uh, steered by both INEE and the Alliance. We've produced a position paper that um, really highlights the um, benefits of collaboration cross sector. Um, and we've seen that uh, from the research and from the feedback, practical feedback from the field, that when you're integrating child protection into education, you're making education safer, more protective, um, you are likely to see benefits to child wellbeing and to educational outcomes. And likewise, if you put an education lens on your child protection programming, you're likely to see increased access to and retention in education programming. Um, we also see uh, that through joint and integrated programming, we uh, avoid duplication. Um, and this in turn uh, encourages cost saving and kind of value for money. And ultimately, it's also what beneficiaries want. Uh, children, young people, their families always ask for education in crises and they ask for education to be safe and protected. Um, so we know that there's benefits to collaboration. And what we've seen under COVID-19, um, it's really brought that home. School closures globally have really highlighted the link between education and child protection um, in almost every context. So I'm based in the UK. And we've seen here how schools and other education settings provide much more than just education. Um, and it's been a, an important wake up call for many governments, for families and for children themselves to understand that schools provide a protective and safe environment for children to flourish and thrive. 
Um, in some cases, they provide nutrition via free or subsidized school meals. They provide essential socialization um, for children so they can build social skills, understand how to exist with other children, young people, um, adults. And they also provide access to other services and referrals into other services. So in some cases, there's psychosocial support in the school, um, health service in the, in the school, and specialized child protection services. In other cases, they can be referred by teachers into these other services. So we developed a report that was really looking at the impact of school closures during COVID. So it followed up from a policy paper we did called Weighing Up the Risk, which was asking to put children and young people at the center of decision-making when closing schools, recognizing that obviously the COVID-19 pandemic um, is a danger to life, but also that closing schools was having a huge impact on children's um, academic, educational, uh, attainment and child protection risks. Um, so we commissioned a report which had in, inside it a comprehensive desk review and a series of key informant interviews, as well as some focused case studies in five contexts, Colombia, DRC, Lebanon, Rwanda, and Sri Lanka. Um, and from this report, we were able to draw some key findings. One which we assumed, but the evidence bore out, was that by closing schools, you were seeing a loss of learning. Um, and this, this was really falling on the most vulnerable uh, children in society, particularly in crisis contexts. So we were seeing that many children weren't able to access um, remote learning opportunities where and if they were in place. Um, children didn't perhaps have laptops or even access to radios, um, and many countries were struggling to provide adequate, adequate um, remote learning opportunities. We also saw a negative impact on child well-being and healthy development um, by children not being in school. They couldn't access the other services I mentioned earlier that provided in school, so nutrition, uh, psychosocial support access to other services and crucially chance to play with and socialize with other children and young people. And the final key finding really that there was hugely amplified child protection risks and harms experienced by children and young people. So for many children, perhaps when they were at home, there was increased levels of violence and child abuse. We saw this in multiple contexts. Um, you know, fa families, parents, caregivers under increased stress because of COVID, perhaps they'd lost their jobs. Um, perhaps there are other pressures on the family, um, and sometimes this was taken out on the children. And of course, many families weren't used to having children there in the day as well. Um, we also saw that uh, there were increased negative coping strategies, like children going into the labour force, so increased child labour, also increased incidences of early marriage. And what we know from other pandemics, obviously nothing has been at this scale in our lifetime, but if we look at the Ebola pandemic in West Africa, we saw that when children are out of school for a sustained period of time, and particularly if they enter into the workplace or if they enter into um, early arranged marriages, they're very unlikely to return to school. So there's a real risk that those vulnerable children in particular may not return to school in, um, when the pandemic is over. And with all of these key findings, the greatest impact falls on the most vulnerable. So particularly girls and children with disabilities, um, these are the uh, members of society who are most likely to miss out on education, most likely to have negative impact on their well-being, and most likely to have increased child protection risks. So in the report, we recommend ways forward, um, which very much aligns with the aims of this project that we first and foremost put children's well-being at the center of decision-making. So we look at the socio-ecological framework, um, which hopefully many of you, particularly child protection practitioners, will be uh, aware of. So we have children at the center, then their families, the school and other services, wider society, and then policy and government. And by putting children at the center, we can see how multiple sectors, multiple services can support them. We're also saying in pandemics to consider the impact of children and young people when you're considering school closures. So if we feel in some contexts that children, particularly young children, are at minimal risk of transmission and infection, then we would say keep that school open because the benefits of having a school open and access to the protective services school provide 
are greater than closing the school. Within this, we need to identify and support the most vulnerable children, those who are most at risk of dropping out and staying dropped out, those at most at risk of increased child protection risks. Um, we need to strengthen child protection and education systems and encourage cross-sector collaboration. We need to pr prioritize access and well-being in the initial stage of the pandemic. So where possible, open schools and keep them open safely. So protective measures are in place in schools, hand washing, masks, um, it, vaccinations for teachers, so we can continue um, education. Um, we need to provide more equitable and inclusive remote learning opportunities. So um, giving out resources, ensure, giving out radios, ensuring access to remote learning for those most vulnerable um, and ensuring appropriate remote learning um, opportunities for children with disabilities and uh, long-term health conditions. And of course, what we've seen the pan from the pandemic is that we need to engage with uh, ongoing planning and preparedness. So disaster risk, risk preparedness and have in place comprehensive plans so that any school closures or closures of other children's focused services minimize the impact on children and young people in this, this pandemic or future crisis. I'll hand back to Michelle now um, to introduce the next speaker. Thank you so much, Mark. We're so grateful that you've joined us today and thank you for sharing these great insights. I will now hand the metaphorical microphone over to Beryl to share the case study from World Vision. World Vision has been in operation in, um, in Somalia since the early 90s. And our approach uh, to humanitarian assistance has been that of integration and also layering projects across sector for full benefit, you know, and maximum impact of the, to the community. So um, in general, the country suffers um, uh, multiple climatic shocks and also conflict that already, you know, weaken the education system and also the social protection uh, mechanisms that the community has. So if you look at 2020, the year that we had COVID, just before that, we, uh, the country had suffered, Puntland had suffered uh, another cyclone. And then we were grappling with a uh, locust invasion and then another cyclone hit, all these multiple shocks happening at the same time, leading to displacement of you know, communities and, and, and households. And at the same time, uh, impacting negatively on the economic livelihoods of the communities. And this directly also impacts on protection and education because uh, each time we have uh, households uh, displaced, that means children are missing out on education. And again, where, when displ displacement happens, again, this means that the protection risks are heightened where the, uh, the displacement has occurred. And then looking at the education sector, again, there are other cultural barriers that the children grapple with. We have uh, gender roles that, that uh, also already affect or way negatively against the enrollment and retention of the girl child. And uh, at, at the same time, if you look at the gross, on, the gross enrollment rate in Puntland, it's, it's about 57.9. And for the girl child, uh, it's, it's just 44%, meaning that quite a number of them are already out of school. And then if you look at the teachers, again, only 14% of them are female. And then the prevalence of child marriage is up is, is, is 45% and FGM. So these are quite a lot of issues that the children are grappling with in an environment where the education and protection need is higher than the available funding to be able to meet, uh, is not commensurate to the need. So in this particular location where World Vision has this project, we already had other uh, health and food security and livelihoods projects going on. So it made sense to also implement an, edu an integrated education and child protection project so that we are able to prevent other negative impacts on the children. And so uh, looking at the fact that education is already a protective factor for the children in Somalia, and it's the place where, again, the children are able to access um, feeding programs and also nutrition screening and, and, and also other health services and wash as well. Schools ended up being a place, a protective space 
where the community as well could also access some services, you know, like um, water tracking, because the schools already had the opportunity to be connected to permanent water sources. And so uh, to, to just try to prevent the, the issue of movement, you know, and, and internal displacement as a result of lack of water. So these are already, uh, we, we've already seen benefits of this because we see the enrollment of children uh, becoming more stable in these locations where we are layering our projects. So when COVID hit, uh, like I mentioned, uh, this particular part of the country was already grappling with locust invasion and the cyclone and all that, and internal displacement. So uh, when COVID hit, there was an abrupt school closure. There wasn't time for kids to carry books home and all this. That meant over 200,000 children just had to stop going to school and the teachers as well could not, uh, of course, uh, continue with the services of teaching. And uh, it, it wasn't long before we began seeing the, uh, the secondary impacts of COVID-19. We began seeing uh, receiving reports of an increase of cases of FGM. Uh, cases of child labor began also being increased and children could be witnessed in the streets uh, doing casual jobs. And this was happening because, again, with the temporary uh, uh, restriction on movement, people could not access um, jobs. And so the families needed to resolve to the negative coping strategies that Mark had mentioned in order to get some extra income at the household. And this happened at the, at the time when in Somalia it was just the onset of the holy month of Ramadan. And so uh, it really complicated issues for the children. And the Child Protection AOR did an, a rapid assessment with the partners. And what we were getting from the children is that the, the main cause of anxiety for the kids was the fact that the schools were closed abruptly and they had a national exam coming up. And at the same time, of course, with the restricted movement, they could not play with their friends and also do the usual iftar, you know, at the, in the evening when they commune together to break the fast. Then, of course, for the children who are internally displaced and in the far rural communities, there was limited access to distant learning options. There wasn't internet or electricity or even access to the radio. And then there was also a closure of the child protection services that were not deemed to be uh, essential services. So the usual places, the usual child-friendly spaces which kids could access psychosocial support, these were temporarily closed because in the effort to try and contain COVID um, pandemic. So with all this happening, partners together with, uh, of course, World Vision globally under the, our COVID um, response, emergency response, developed guidelines to just help us uh, be able to uh, implement a joint response between child protection and education, G largely glo and globally. Uh, this pandemic was not deemed as a, uh, was ma mainly looked at as a health pandemic. And so there was very little consideration of the child protection or other education needs that kept coming up. So what uh, World Vision did was to prepare guidelines, first of all, focusing on uh, ensuring that learning is continuing while the kids are at home, and at the same time, providing psychosocial support. Then the second one was just to be able to provide the parents and caregivers to create a positive environment for the children at home. And also looking at preventing and mitigating risks for children uh, during school closure. So under the first objective of uh, supporting protection and psychosocial needs, while at the same time meeting the learning needs of the children, what we were able to do here was to already team up with existing structures in the community that we had built uh, even before COVID happened. So here, and again, looking at the fact that the, the religious functions were still continuing, uh, the mosques were still you know, open, and we already had existing relationships with, uh, with the faith leader groups and committees. We, we, we leveraged on this to be able to infuse um, child protection messaging, as well as COVID-19 prevention. And so through the faith leaders, we, what, what we did was just to support them with the public address systems for them to be able to still dispel myths around COVID and, and also address some of the, the, the protection issues that were coming up, like the FGM, like I mentioned, that I had mentioned earlier. So some of these uh, protection committees that already existed consist of uh, parents who are also in the community education committees. So these worked out well for us because they were they, uh, during their, uh, their community mobilization, they would also address the issue of child labor 
and, and, and try to, to, to sensitize the community on the availability of the distance learning options that the government had already begun rolling out. So for those who could access the radio lessons, uh, these committees would sensitize them on the existence of this particular program so that the children tune in and are not seen in the streets out there. And uh, again, while uh, taking cognizance of the fact that this was an exam year, and then we had uh, we had caregivers who had lost livelihoods and their, their children could not uh, sit for exams because they did not have exam fees. So what this project was able to do was also support some of these kids that have come from vulnerable um, households, especially those whose parents had lost livelihoods due to COVID to be able to sit for the exams. And then again, like I mentioned, when the school closure happened, it was abrupt. And so most of the learning materials that are kept in school remained in school. So what this project did teaming up with the community education committees and the teachers was to try and distribute reading materials for children so that some learning can go on at home, especially for those who could not access the distance learning options that were available. So, uh, and then another thing was to continuously disseminate messages around child protection and the available mechanisms for referral. So here what happened was again uh, together because the CPAOR and the education class had already developed joint advocacy messages. What we did was to, uh, to just uh, provide these messages already in the Somali language so that the committees could be able to also share these messages, especially where uh, access to, to, to child protection services could be found, especially during COVID. And then there was also a myth that people who are going to hospitals were likely to get COVID. So there are even people who are getting sick, but were avoiding to go to hospital because of the perception that if you went to hospital, you'd get COVID. So we were able to work with these community structures to dispel all these myths and to provide um, information on where to access child protection services for the caregivers and the children that needed it. So under the objective of supporting caregivers and parents to create a, a positive environment for learning at home, we were already implementing a literacy project where we were conducting reading awareness. So what happened here was that um, we, we just infused COVID-19 prevention messages in the already developed curriculum for reading awareness. And again, uh, because this could not be done in any other way, we could not do this through radio or, or um, internet uh, because the infrastructure is, is not very developed in Puntland. What we did again was to adapt this particular reading awareness sessions to enable the parents to use the daily chores, the daily activities at home to infuse some learning out of them. So um, this was done and, uh, and we began just to uh, allow, to just share messages with the caregivers that play was necessary. So as much as there was a, a restriction on movement, the, it wasn't working out well for the children to just be restricted within the home. So these messages were being disseminated by the community education committees, as well as the faith leader groups that had already been trained on protection. Another thing was that uh, because the, the religious activities were going on, it made more sense for us again to train these uh, faith leaders on psychological first aid so that they're able to provide in-person support. So this also uh, helped us and equip the caregivers with the skills that they needed to also overcome these difficult times and to reduce the, the physical violence that was being witnessed at home because of the stresses of lack of livelihoods and all this that was being witnessed in the country at this time. Then on the third uh, objective, what happened here is that now when uh, initially the schools were closed for just two weeks, but when we saw that things were not going to, were not this, the opening was not happening anytime soon, what happened here again was that we quickly worked with um, uh, the teachers uh, to train them on PFA. So the, the education cluster together with the child protection AOR in the country developed guidelines for mental health and psychosocial support for the teachers as well as the students while at home. And so we use these guidelines to also orient our teachers and then uh, provided them with airtime because now this could not be done, you know, uh, face to face. What we did was to provide the teachers with uh, some airtime so, so that they're able to 
to follow up on the children, because again, looking at the risks that I had shared earlier on of FGM and early marriage, it was likely that when schools reopened, we'd lose quite a lot of them to, to these other negative coping strategies that we were seeing being adopted. So we had the teachers calling the children at least once a week, and then uh, because they had been trained to detect any signs of distress or any issues that the children might be facing at home, they would again now link these particular children and their caregivers with the child protection uh, committees in order to access any other specialized services that were needed. So what happened here was that they would give a phone call, especially to the families and the, to the children that already were known to be very vulnerable and would uh, most likely not turn up when the school reopening was announced. So this helped us quite a lot. And at the announcement of the reopening, we saw an increase in uh, enrollment. We had um, uh, our enrollment going up. And of course, while all this was happening, we also did other uh, safe school uh, you know, opening measures like fumigation, linkage with the WASH team in order to uh, just ensure that we have permanent water sources, or some sort of uh, water tracking happening in these schools. Because another thing again was that just before reopening, we did like a random uh, assessment uh, within the, our project areas. And the parents were telling us and the caregivers was that they were not comfortable releasing their children to go back to school when COVID was still happening in the country. So in order to reassure the caregivers to allow their children to go back to school, we had to demonstrate that uh, some measures were being put in place to ensure that the schools were safe spaces and safe places for their children to go back. And, uh, and, and, and so, of course, in addition to the back to school campaigns that were being done by the community, uh, it helped us to achieve some of these results. So, of course, uh, there were issues that we faced and the, the challenges. Some of them I've already mentioned, poor internet connectivity, uh, and the fact that child protection services were not initially classified as essential, limited funding, like I mentioned, the need versus um, the available funding uh, and uh, delayed response and all these, these are challenges that we face across the board. However, what really came through for us was our relationship with the existing community-based structures uh, to be able to disseminate messaging and to just be uh, on the forefront of watching out any protection needs and incidents that needed to be reported. And of course, also working with them to disseminate uh, messages in a child-friendly manner to the children and also to the caregivers. Uh, another thing that I wanted to mention uh, there was the fact that uh, the collaboration again between the, the education cluster and the child protection area in the country proved to be very successful because time and again, we'd have meetings to address the issues that kept coming up, uh, especially that would affect the education of the children as well as um, uh, the protection. And so towards the, the, the school opening, actually some of the child protection services were now opened uh, as a result of the lobbying of the, the, the partners and the, the cluster. So as I wrap up, one of the key recommendations that uh, I would say is, is that there's room for adoption of innovative approaches by community-based structures during emergencies for stronger cross-sector collaboration. I'm saying this because as much as the committees and the community-based committees had the knowledge and with the restriction of movement, we had to come up with innovative ways of making sure that work was still going on. And so this is where we find um, things like, you know, providing them with public address system in order for them to be able to just provide these messages without crowding in small spaces, uh, coming up with, you know, breaking trainings in batches, you know, so that uh, there are trainings that we could not do, you know, um, uh, through internet because of the lack of that infrastructure. So just being able to do them in small scale within the villages really helped us to make um, impact during this time. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that is all I had for you from Somalia. Great. Thank you so much, Beryl. Um, we are so grateful that you're with us today. And thank you for sharing this inspiring example of collaboration between child protection and education in emergencies. I particularly enjoyed hearing about how the communities really um, took action to support the children in their community. So that was a great example to hear. Um, we will now hear an example from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, so I will pa pass the floor to you, Jonas. Thank you very much, uh, Michel. I'm uh, Mr. Jonas Abimana from Democratic Republic of Congo, and uh, I'm working for BFED, 
as the national NGO based in the eastern of DRC. And I'm also a focal point for fair standards and uh, have been highly engaged in the IME and the child protection initiative. In terms of context of uh, DR Congo, uh, as you know, the COVID-19 uh, arrived in a context where we had many other crises uh, within uh, Ebola disease, Ebola virus. And also the area of Eastern of DRC is uh, uh, an area where we have many armed conflict. And now, uh, two weeks ago, we had also a volcanic eruption. Uh, all this uh, crisis have impact on uh, uh, child protection in, in the context of COVID-19. It, it, this is a challenge. Some problems have been uh, registered within the children's well-being. The COVID-19 had many, many impacts to, to children's well-being. And also access to education uh, was a problem and it's still also a problem because, you know, sometimes schools have been closed, they reopened, and uh, based to information we have now, it seems that in the nearest uh, days, future days, probably uh, schools should be again closed. And also uh, water and sanitation uh, was a big problem because many schools didn't have access to water and sanitation. And also in communities, you know, the access to water and sanitation is under uh, 32% of the population DRC. So the COVID-19 was also uh, a factor to increase the vulnerability to water and sanitation. Also accessibility to food and the livelihood, as my colleagues were saying, uh, we have seen that uh, access to food and the livelihood for families was also a big problem. And it is still also a problem up to now. In terms of solutions we adopted to the crisis, we were able to train 21 community volunteers. These volunteers were working with our organization before the COVID-19 pandemic. We trained 21 community volunteers to ensure that they can be going in families door-to-door -door strategies, training people and informing people on COVID-19 issues, especially informing children on COVID-19 prevention. There were many restrictions to people to be meeting and organizing groups, but our volunteers went door to door educating people, parents and children on COVID-19 prevention. Also, uh, in terms of responding to community and family livelihoods, we gave some loans to vulnerable women to empower them, to make them able to be rising a small money and how they can be responding to their families. But also we worked on well-being to children because we have done some activities to maintain well-being of some children. And also we are supporting the distance learning as an alternative solution to the COVID-19 problem. We have registered some success in our responses. We were able to distribute 500 masks to children. We were targeting those children who were most vulnerable uh, within IDPs and uh, refugees children, and those children from very, very poorest families. We were able to be distributing masks to them. And also we were able to educate more than 6,500 children and their families on COVID-19 prevention. This education have been done passing door to door strategies. And when some measures were uh, changed by the government, we tried to organize some discussion groups on COVID-19 and we were able to educate uh, more than 6,500 children on COVID-19 prevention. Also, we installed a water tank in some health centers because we have seen pregnant women had need in water and we, we were installing uh, water tanks in different health centers here in Goma City in urban area and in rural areas to facilitate pregnant women and when also children came to the health center to facilitate them have access to drink water in health center. And also we continue doing monitoring in 280 schools here in Afkivu in the ethnic of DRC where we are now working 
in terms of uh, supporting uh, uh, distance learning. It's a program that made by the government and the UNICEF. Uh, our organization is supporting in terms of monitoring to see how distance learning is done. And we are now registering challenges and uh, many problems based to the distance learning uh, program now. In terms of challenges, distance learning is not accessible to all children because we have seen that there are many, many areas where families cannot have access to television and uh, access to radio messages. There are many, many areas where uh, radio coverage is a problem and uh, distance learning uh, is not accessible to all children, but also protecting children from domestic violence. Well, this is also a challenge because we were not able to do a monitoring, you know, in terms of uh, when COVID-19 arrived, uh, there are many, many restrictions to be moving from an area to another. So we were not able to, to, to monitor uh, domestic violence in different uh, homes and different communities. This is a challenge. But also, we were not able to have access to enough funding. You know, uh, COVID-19 require uh, to have many, many supports. Uh, but we were not able to have access to funding in terms of response. This was also a challenge. We have one key recommendation, uh, working together in an integrated approach, including education, child protection, health, and wash, should help to mobilize the resources and also expertise, but also uh, responding to COVID-19 requires also a socio-economical approach, as you know, uh, depending to learn lesson from Ebola response here in DRC. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jonas, uh, for joining us today and for sharing this great example of the work you've been doing. Um, it was definitely a very interesting um, example to hear, and it sounds like there's just some great work being done. We're now going to move into the Q&A session. I think I'll start with a question for Beryl. Um, Beryl, were most faith leaders supportive of your goals? Do you think people were more likely to believe information about COVID and other topics if it was presented from trusted faith leaders? Yeah, sure, Michelle. Um, Faith leaders in our context are very influential and very trusted members of the community. And so it, it, it made more, much more sense uh, for us to partner with them in this initiative uh, because we have already been working with them in um, you know addressing other cultural issues around FGM and child marriage. So coming from them, the message is likely to be taken in uh, compared to where it's coming from other sources. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Beryl. Um, my next question will be for uh, Mark. Um, Mark, we have one participant who agrees in theory with what you've presented, but is wondering how can teachers who are frontline workers take additional risks when they are parents themselves? Yeah, I mean, this is a, a huge challenge. And one of the things we try to address in the weighing up of risks, um, and it's not just teachers who are parents themselves, but um, teachers in general are likely statistically as an adult over 21 more likely to um, get infected and had severe consequences from COVID. Um, our recommendations for school reopening are schools to be re reopened safely, which includes uh, ultimately vaccinations for the teachers and other frontline workers, but also for all um, the safety physical safety protocol to be put in place. So uh, restricted movement for children between classes so they're not mixing with each other, um, masks to be worn, uh, where possible ventilation or outdoor teaching, um, uh, hand sanitizer, frequent washing of hands. Um, and uh, yeah, basically better spacing out of schools and school premises, which in uh, contexts where the weather is favorable or a bit more easy to implement. Um, um, many of the major agencies came together, UNICEF, UNESCO, and Save the Children to develop guidance on safe school reopening. And INEE contributed to that and supports that. Um, and the Alliance have also contributed to INEE's um, guidance on education under COVID um, to ensure that there's child protection provision within that and all of that um, as I mentioned, focuses on um, 
safe school reopening and protection of education staff. Great, thank you so much, Mark. Um, I think that was a great question and just a really interesting angle to think about. Um, Jonas, uh, one of our attendees is wondering if there were specific responses for marginalized children tailored to their needs or edu for education and protection. So how did you reach more marginalized children with your activities? Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Uh, yes, the answer is that yes, we, we reached some most vulnerable and uh, some children who have a specific vulnerability. Uh, within uh, IDPs, we have also been targeting uh, displaced children. And up to now, we are continuing to respond to these needs. But also, we have some marginalized uh, children like uh, pygmies, uh, the children from specific groups who are marginalized within pygmies and, uh, uh, and refugees. We, we have also been engaged with uh, children living with disability in different uh, areas. So this kind of uh, children have been targeted and we have been doing some response with them depending to their needs. Thank you. Mm. And I guess what would be really interesting to hear a little bit more about is like, how did you tailor the programming to their needs or what were your methods to ensure that they were included? You know, as I said, uh, Michelle, we, we use the, our local community volunteers. It seems that we use the community-based approach. We have been engaged with uh, local leaders, with uh, uh, leaders from different churches and the civil society organization uh, within the different CBOs. And we have been working with all these people to target and to identify these uh, children and uh, to define how we can be respond to their needs. Great, thank you so much. Um, this next question is for Beryl and is like along a similar theme. Um, one of our attendees has asked, what about the mental health of children when they return back to school? Um, how has school supported the children's mental health and well-being to retain them in school? Yeah, so as we speak, uh, schools have, have reopened in Somalia. And like I mentioned, uh, during the school closure, we had already uh, trained the teachers on how to conduct PFA and also link them with the referral pathway to you know, the health facilities. And so as we speak right now, this is still going on within the school setting because it's something they had begun during the school closure. So if at all there are children that need to be referred for specialized uh, MHPSS services, the teachers are aware of where to get this service from, as well as the faith leaders. Great, thank you so much. For Jonas, uh, we have a, a question around how the government um, has supported your response. Has there been any concrete actions from, from the local government? Thank you, Michelle. Uh, the problem was that uh, the government were not uh, prepared to the response. As uh, Michael was saying, the DRC is one of the countries where we don't have uh, strong policies in terms of responding to crisis. So the government had a very big problem to mobilize the resources because there was, was no any preparation and any contingency plans. But uh, the government were calling to donors, UN agencies and uh, international organization. They come, they work, they work together and they supported each other. For example, many coordination mechanisms were under the government leadership with a support from local, from international and UN agencies who were bringing their resources to, to be helping the government. We have been the government engaged, but in terms of preparation and responses, there, there, there are still many needs in terms of pushing the government to make strong policies that include uh, contingencies plans, including the pandemic and the epidemics. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we actually just had a really excellent question and I'd like to pose this to, to each of the panelists. What were your mechanisms to detect child protection issues during school closure? So how did you ensure detection of child protection risks during school closure? And I would be interested to hear from Jonas and Beryl on their experiences as well as from Mark on what other um, methods he may have heard from uh, colleagues around the world. I, I think that uh, child protection issues uh, are one of most uh, key issues to be addressed during the COVID-19. 
when the schools are closed, I think uh, this is a problem because at home, parents are not educated on how to protect the children. Also, the linkage between uh, uh, teachers, social workers, and uh, children when they are based at home, this was a very problem. Uh, but also, you know, um, uh, in sometimes the, the violence is based on uh, using technology. I have seen that many children were spending their time uh, on the television in their homes and also using telephone. So there were many, many uh, violences based on using also technology. But uh, the monitoring of these uh, cases was, was very, very complicated. But when the school were reopened, we are making risk reduction plans in the schools where we are now integrating all these issues on how parents should be working with teachers and social workers when school will be also closed. I think there are many, many issues improved. We hope that there will be a strong collaboration between teachers, parents, and the children, because now we are making contentious and reduction plans from different schools. Great. Thank you, Jonas Farrell. I would love to hear um, from your perspective. Yeah, so one uh, way through which we were able to get to detect child protection uh, incidents in the community was through our accountability um, and feedback mechanisms. We already had a toll free line through which the community could, which was already popular with the community for reporting, you know, to giving us feedback and complaints. So during COVID, what, what we did was to be able to adapt this particular toll free line for, uh, for reporting. Uh, safeguarding and, and other child protection and GBV incidents. And then, so what we did again was to disseminate this particular number through sending direct messages to our beneficiaries and, and just letting them know that in case there is any issue around you that you need to report, either safeguarding child protection or GBV, they could uh, reach out to us through that and then we would provide referral to, to services. So that was one way through which we could detect. And of course, our the child protection committees who are on the ground, the community education committees who are close there. And I think I already even mentioned that they were able to rescue over 400 children who had been from FGM because they are in the community and they know the circumstances. So when they are spotted in the community, that's already an, an early warning. And so they're able to rescue children. So with this particular knowledge and, uh, and, and the toll free line, we would be able to just give them back a call and just tell them, please report to the government, report to the nearest authority to prevent any further escalation of child protection issues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beryl. And then Mark, um, are there any additional methods that you came across in your work? Under the report, we weren't able to commission primary research. We weren't able to reach out directly to children and young people. Um, but you'll see in the country specific um, case studies where we've been able to get um, either uh, NGOs or national systems who've reported on child protection risks and child protection reports, uh, reports of child abuse increasing. Um, but we recognize that for, you know, for this report, we really wanted to capture the voices of children and young people themselves. Um, we have cited some excellent reports, for example, Save the Children's Work, where they capture the voice of children and young people. But what we've done across INEE and the Alliance is commission a phase two to this um, research piece, which is happening throughout this year with in-depth primary research uh, happening in Lebanon, uh, DRC and Colombia, um, working directly with children and young people to get their voices. So we hope early next year to have that report published, and that will be really the voices of children and young people. And the researchers, including Jonas, who's on the call, the researchers um, are using some very interesting um, research methodology to directly reach out to children and young people. Um, so yeah, um, unfortunately, we weren't able to do it this case, but we've commissioned it now for this year. Great, thanks so much, Mark. And thank you everyone for attending. Uh, and we hope you all have a lovely day from all of us at the Alliance and INEE. Thank you and goodbye.